Hey, what's up Seekers, welcome back. We have a bit of a challenge ahead of us today. We're going to try to get out of our 21st century minds and go back into the head of a 12th century philosopher who saw the world in an entirely different way than we do. And I don't just mean that culturally, sociologically, politically, or economically, I mean that in a cosmological sense, in the very way which they understood the cosmos to be. We're going to be diving into the Middle Ages through the mind of Maimonides, who had an entirely different picture of the cosmos and the way it functions than we do. Join us as we explain. We started in the last video to talk about Maimonides' notion of the divine overflow, the Fayyid or Shefa, the active ingredient flowing through his depiction of the cosmos, keeping it in being and all that jazz. Let us unpack this notion of the overflow and his picture of the cosmos in general because it's going to be really central to understanding not only all of Maimonides' metaphysics, epistemology, and religious philosophy, both his understanding of prophecy and providence, but also in the understanding of his potential mysticism. Whereas according to the modern conception of the universe, with the sun at its center of our solar system and the various planets orbiting around it on their elliptical paths through mostly empty space, the ancients, going all the way back to Plato, Aristotle, and Ptolemy, and up until the Middle Ages, continuing really up until Kepler and Newton, believed that each of the visible planets and the set stars were embedded in a series of concentric, rotating, transparent spheres, almost like translucent layers of an onion nestled within one another, silently turning in the night sky, each one turning the next. It was by way of these spheres that the pre-modern mind made sense of the movement of the visible celestial bodies and all that was in between them, adding additional spheres as necessary to explain for things like the axial precession and oscillation of the equinoxes and the obliquity of the ecliptic. Don't ask me what that means. By the time we get to Maimonides, the full number of these spheres is 9, or sometimes 10 in total, and not only do these spheres serve to explain the physical cosmology of the universe in the Middle Ages, but they also begin to partake in the metaphysical explanation of how God creates and sustains the world. This second metaphysical explanation takes either an Aristotelian or a Neoplatonic guise, and sometimes, as we now know, a bit of both. In the original Aristotelian version, each of the celestial spheres are moved by a separate intellect, also often identified with the various angels mentioned in religious literature. The first and furthermost sphere from us, the first moved, was moved by the prime mover, otherwise known as the unmoved mover, otherwise known as God. The metaphysical momentum from the first sphere carried forth to the separate intellect of the second sphere, moving it in turn, and it the next intellect and next sphere, and so on and so forth. For Aristotle, this movement of the spheres isn't only to be read the way that we understand movement, namely relocating something from point A to point B, but rather, primarily, as moving something from a state of potential to a state of actualization, from the possible to the realized. This metaphysical system, which hopefully is slowly coming into view for you now, gets further linked up with Neoplatonism to explain the metaphysics of emanations from the One turning the spheres and their respective intellects into ten ontological gradations of being through which God, the One, progressively instantiates and perpetuates the physical universe into being. So for what was in Aristotle, simply a matter of movement from the potential to the actual comes for the Neoplatonists actual hypostases, actual entities of the divine overflow making their way down to our reality through the various spheres and their intellects. The syncretized Aristotelian Neoplatonic system ends up looking something like this, give or take some variations for the different thinkers during the Middle Ages. God is understood as pure actualized thought thinking itself. God's self-reflection generates the first emanation from God, which is called Nous, or the first intellect. Because the first intellect contemplates both itself and God, it introduces multiplicity into the system. And what is produced from this multiplicity is a series of intellects, ten in total usually, each of those intellects going on to produce its own celestial sphere, each nestled in one another like a series of Russian dolls. Here comes an important part. This perpetual emanative process continues through the spheres of each of the planets until we get to the final sphere, the sphere of the moon, and its particular separate intellect, known as the Okal al-Fa'al in Arabic, the Seich al-Hapoel in Hebrew, the agent intellect or active intellect in English, or the AI for short. This tenth intellect, the active intellect, the AI, 
which Maimonides sometimes refers to as the divine intellect, is super important to us humans for two reasons. One for a upward reason and one for a downward reasons. Allow me to explain. Firstly, the active intellect, via the overflow that it receives from the spheres and intellects above it, generates and governs all that is to be found in the sublunar realm where you and I live. And as such, via the flow that runs through it, is responsible for all intellection, actualization, inspiration, revelation, prophecy and providence down here on planet Earth. And secondly, the active intellect, being the last in this great chain of intellects, makes it the final bridge between heaven and earth, and the first rung on the ladder back up to the cause of all causes to God, the kind of place that a mystic might be looking for if they wanted to start climbing the ladder. You feel me? Adam Afterman describes this cosmic structure of which the active intellect serves as the final or first rung, depending on which direction you're looking from, as a metaphysical ladder that exists between the human and the metaphysical realms, rising towards God, allowing the human to climb such a ladder all the way to its divine top, to the source of the divine overflow, animating and actualizing the cosmos with all of its rotating spheres into being. Maimonides describes this divine overflow with these words. The overflow coming from God brings into being the separate intellects and overflows from these intellects so that each one of them brings another into being, continuing up to the active intellect, which brings the bringing of separate beings into being to an end. Maimonides is also very careful to let the reader know that this metaphysical overflow to and then from the active intellect, while it can be metaphorically described as energy, spirit, divine light, or flowing water, it should never be taken literally as such, for that would be to corporealize an aspect of the divine, the greatest mistake in theology which Maimonides constantly tries to tirelessly combat. This neat cosmic picture of a divine overflowing, flowing from God, generating a series of cosmic intellects, each one of them generating the next and their respective spheres, via the flow running through them, overflowing from one to the next up until the final intellect, the active intellect, which overflows into our planetary sphere and consciousness, is adopted by Maimonides from his Greek philosophical predecessors, Plato, Aristotle, Ptolemy, and Plotinus, as adapted by the Muslim philosophers Al-Farabi, Ibn Sina, and others. It's here again that we see the continued attempt in the Thought of Maimonides to reconcile classic Aristotelian ideas like those of the separate intellects and the first intellect, the unmoved mover, with classic Neoplatonic ideas of the divine overflow emanating from the one which is beyond being, intellectualizing the latter, and emanationizing the former. And in this, we see an active attempt on Maimonides' behalf to mitigate what might be the core contradiction in the guide, his problematic simultaneous stance on absolute divine transcendence, and yet also holding on to divine immanence, God as fundamentally unknowable, incomprehensible, and indescribable, and God as intellect, overflowing into reality, reaching through the active intellect to the human, and through which the human can potentially even reach back. As my friend and colleague Dr. Justin Sledge put it so beautifully, this kind of communion with the divine, the human and divine intellect calling to each other through the crystalline spheres of the heavens, when our senses and intellect gaze up to contemplate the vastness of the spheres of the cosmos. So which is it for Maimonides? Is God utterly indescribable and unreachable, which Maimonides seems so bent on defending? Or is God an intellect emanating out to us, reaching through the cosmic spheres, beckoning for us to reach back. I don't know if we'll be able to answer this confused and intertwined contradiction of Aristotelianism and Neoplatonism, but we'll try as we go along. You know they say a joke that Maimonides called his book the Guide for the Perplexed because if you weren't confused before reading it, by the time it was through with you, you most definitely would be. Let us hold on and take it slow and take these ideas one at a time and try not get too perplexed along the journey. The concept of the Fayyads, the metaphysical overflow, particularly from the active intellect and onwards, down to us, is a really central axis in Maimonides' philosophy. It is the mechanism by which our world comes into and stays in existence. It is, as Adam Afterman puts it, that which operates on the fringe between the mundane and the metaphysical realms, bridging the two together. Religious thinkers of the Middle Ages, as Afterman rightly points out, were perplexed by this question of the exact point of contact between the mundane and the divine, between the physical and the metaphysical. And even those who posited an unbridgeable divide between the two still had to account for moments where the two made contact, 
which after all they had to if the world was to come into existence at all. And then of course there were the questions of things that crossed over this cosmic line, things which had to, again if we were talking about a revealed theistic religion and not just some naturalistic deism, namely things like divine revelation and divine supervision, divine providence and prophecy. For Maimonides, it is the divine overflow from the active intellect, which is the instrumental active ingredient in all of his religious metaphysical activity. Let's take Maimonides' theory of prophecy, for example, which, according to Itamar Grunwald, may be regarded as the coping stone of his entire philosophical enterprise and the most dramatic phase of his entire philosophic activity, in which the entire drama of Maimonides' intellectual enterprise unfolds. You ready for some drama? Let's go. Maimonides' theory of prophecy is built beautifully right upon his metaphysics and epistemology of the divine overflow and the active intellect. For Maimonides, prophecy is an illuminated state of mind, which results from an influx of the intellectual overflow from the active intellect. An individual with the proper preparation and character, whom Maimonides in his Mishnah Torah, Part 1, Foundations of the Torah, in an abbreviated and less technical version of what appears in the guide, describes as a very wise sage of strong character who is never overcome by their natural inclinations, and of sound physique who will advance and separate themselves from the masses who proceed in the darkness of the time, training themselves to clear their mind of any idle passing thoughts, distractions, passions, vanities, or intrigues of the moment, and think instead only about the eternal, about God. Their mind, constantly directed upward, striving to comprehend the holy and pure forms, the separate intellects which flow from God, of which we spoke earlier, and gazing at the wisdom of the Holy One, blessed be God, in its entirety, from the most elevated form until the navel of the earth, appreciating God's greatness in them. When this strong and sagely individual, with undivided attention, follows the stream of consciousness from beneath the throne of the divine, through the celestial spheres, and the accompanying intellects or states of consciousness through the consciousness of the sublunar sphere uniting their own intellect with the active intellect, then, writes Maimonides, the spirit of prophecy will immediately rest upon the individual. It seems here in the text of the Mishnah Torah, and even more so in the guide, that prophecy is almost a natural consequence and a result brought about by the individual. If you train your mind, character, and body, clearing them out thoroughly and meditating only upon God with proper philosophical clarity, you will indeed unite your mind with the flow of consciousness from the active intellect and achieve that state of mind which Maimonides calls prophecy. That is what he seems to be saying. Just a side note, we're going to return God willing to the forms of meditation that Maimonides teaches and guides the individual in, Particularly when we get to the infamous chapter 351 in the guide, we're going to see some of the extreme meditation practices that this great rationalist philosopher advocates. But before we do that, let us talk about two bits of drama that emerge from Maimonides' theory of prophecy. Number one, for those that read the Maimonidean project as an attempt to naturalize all religious phenomena, they read this Maimonidean theory of prophecy as a key example of his naturalization of religion. Now, while it may not be what we moderns consider to accord with a natural conception of reality, for a philosopher of the Middle Ages, Maimonides' theory of prophecy relied on no element of the supernatural or divine intervention. Prophecy for Maimonides seems to simply follow naturally from his Neoplatonized Aristotelian conception of the universe and reality, with religious and theological language just slapped on it seemingly for his writing to the masses. But for all intents and purposes, what he's presenting is seemingly a scientifically current version of the cosmos during the Middle Ages and explaining how that naturally leads to prophecy. As Sarah Pesson writes, prophecy for Maimonides is a natural phenomena stemming precisely from the cosmological structure of reality and the epistemological psychological structure of the human mind. And the prophet then is merely one who has the ability to receive the overflow from the active intellect and the varying levels of prophecy merely correspond to different levels of engagement with the overflow from the active intellect, nothing magical, supernatural, or particularly even religious going on here. This represents one general reading of Maimonides, a popular one among scholars, but still just one of many. One challenge to this reading comes from what Maimonides asserts next, however, about the prophetic experience itself. Maimonides goes on to say that even if an individual has made themselves a fully proper fitting vessel to receive prophecy, to receive this overflow from the active intellect, God can willfully withhold prophecy 
from the individual and stop the divine overflow from reaching them. At first glance, this doesn't seem like a crazy thing to say. God is generally conceived as omnipotent and can definitely control the overflow coming from God. But for those wanting to read Maimonides' naturalized hot takes on all of religious phenomena, this instance of divine intervention, even in an act of restriction and holding back, is a very difficult thorn to square with the all-natural Aristotelian concept of a god who merely knocks over the first causal domino and then backs off into the distant galactic recesses of deism. How such a god again intervenes to hold back the flow in an otherwise natural system where the flow should reach the individual seems to be an infringement of this divine Aristotelian naturalism. Now, if you thought that one was some hot philosophical drama, just wait for the second one. The second drama that I'd like to touch upon will demonstrate again just how diversely Maimonides is read, from a thoroughgoing Aristotelian deistic naturalist to a radical, apophatic, apotheotic mystic. Maimonides concludes the opening section of chapter 7 of the Foundations of the Torah that we were quoting from earlier by writing that after a person has adequately prepared their mind and body and successfully meditated upon God, right away the Holy Spirit will rest upon them and their soul will become intermingled with the level of angels, the degree of consciousness, called Ishim, literally men, and as a result, the individual will be transformed into a different being, v'yahafeich le'ish acher, and they will understand with a knowledge unlike the knowledge they previously possessed, for they shall ascend above all wise men, as the prophet said of Saul, and the Spirit of God shall descend upon you, and thou shalt prophesy among them, and thou shalt be transformed into another man, slash into a different person. Maimonides here, if we can read this carefully, seems to be saying that a successful achievement of prophetic consciousness, angelic consciousness, transforms the individual from their former self into a new self, what he calls an angelic self. What on earth is going on here? Let us try and make sense of it. If, for Maimonides, it is the mind and the intellect, not the body, which is the primary aspect and locus of identity of the individual, then, wherever the mind is, that is where the individual truly is. And this priority of the mind over the body is certainly the case for Maimonides. For Maimonides, the body is a mere nuisance, with all its distractions, temptations, and ineptitude, whose demise and weakening, according to the doctor himself in the guide, one should look forward to because it will finally allow our primary element, our divine component, the mind, to soar unabated. On Maimonides' logic then, it follows then that if one state of mind, one state of consciousness, has reached the angelic realm, the realm of Ishim, which Maimonides associates with the last of the separate intellects, the active intellect, then you've become an angel, you've become one of the Ishim, one of the angelic men. And he finds evidence for this in the biblical account where King Saul is told by the prophet Samuel that he will prophesy and become an ish acher, a different man, and not just any man, according to Maimonides, but he shall become one of the angels called man, one of the ishim, namely that King Saul would come to embody the angelic state of consciousness called men. Talk about becoming a new man, hey? But in doing so, one transforms their being, their intellect, the primary aspect of their being, into this angelic consciousness, into union with the active intellect, transforming their former old human self in the process into something new and cosmic, something metaphysical and angelic. This, in Afterman's jargony language, is Maimonides' formula of the noetic union of the union of the intellects to designate the status achieved by the human who transforms into an angel and thus reaches the eschatological angelic state, an angelic state associated with the final redemptive destiny of mankind and the end of days. This idea of becoming an angel may seem very weird to us in the 21st century, but for the ancients and the Middle Ages, this phenomena called angelification and its cousin demonification was a rather commonplace doctrine found everywhere including but not limited to Sethian, Enochian, Apocalyptic, and Qumranic literature in Hesiod, Empedocles, Plato, Plutarch, Clement, Origen, and Philo of Alexandria, Gregory of Nyssa, Athanasius, Plotinus, and Zostrianos, and continues in Judaism in the literature of the German Pietists, the Chassidi Ashkenaz, and in both the Aesthetic and Theosophic Kabbalists, in general religious poetry of the time, 
And as we just saw in medieval Jewish philosophy, even in people that we consider to be the arch rationalists of Judaism. Angelification, this idea that an individual may undergo a process in which they become an angelic being, may be understood as a subcategory of deification, the process by which a human transforms into a god, with angelification being a move in that transformative direction, but not going quite all the way. The various angels for the ancients were situated along the great chain of being, between the human and the divine, higher or lower on the chain, depending on their rank. To become an angel, or a daemon, therefore, is to ascend above the category of human in both power and intelligence, but not quite as much as a fully-fledged god. What on earth is Maimonides, Judaism's supposedly preeminent rationalist and arch-nemesis of mysticism, doing with this concept of angelification? He's like an anaphylactic diabetic with a Snickers bar. Drama indeed. There's two ways of making sense of Maimonides' talk of angelification. Either Maimonides is brilliantly mining the rich imagery and mythology of mysticism, sneakily rationalizing these wildly irrational ideas, or maybe, just maybe, Maimonides actually believed that the universe was comprised of concentric spherical stratified realms, each one consisting of its own degree of consciousness, its own separate intellect, which Maimonides identifies with the various angels, stretching from the human to the divine, like almost all philosophers of his time believed, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim, and that the human could ascend through the angelic spheres towards the divine, as he writes. Or maybe both. If we wanted to read Maimonides' prophecy in a mystical direction, it wouldn't be all that difficult. Prophecy for Maimonides rests on the boundary of the physical and the metaphysical. It is the human capacity to overcome the barrier of materiality characteristic of the sublunar realm, to become receptive to the power overflowing from the metaphysical realm, and cross over into the immaterial metaphysical realm and become an angel. Prophecy was a mode of human perfection. The human self, by radically altering its substance, could be partially, or in some cases even fully, integrated into the divine realm. Effectively transforming the ancient concept of angelification, of the transformation of the individual through the ascension to a higher plane of existence and consciousness into a mystical philosophical process, converting the idea of the angel into a necessary metaphysical entity and rung along the great chain of being, in our case identifying the angels called Ishim or the archangel Gabriel with the active intellect. A state of consciousness and being which Maimonides tells us that the human, in some way, can unite with and even become. Here we see Maimonides at his finest, the brilliant logician, mathematician, by the power of his abstraction, converting an ancient, bizarre, and arcane mystical doctrine of humans becoming gods and angels into a philosophically, astronomically correct language for the Middle Ages, teaching the possibility for the human to unite with and transform into the cosmic intellect of the sublunar sphere into the active intellect itself. And for the cherry on top, the great teacher and prophetic figure himself, Abraham Joshua Heschel, believed that Maimonides may have believed himself to have reached this mystical state of consciousness that he called prophecy. For some extra fun, check out this handwritten note by Heschel that he wrote about Maimonides' prophecy dug up by my good friend Yehuda Berzerkin in the Heschel archives. I'd like to end this week's presentation by looking for a moment at the afterlife of Maimonides' idea of prophecy among the Kabbalists that came after him to see what the Kabbalists do with Maimonides' prophetic angelification, not to conflate him with the Kabbalists or them with him, but just to show how amenable his ideas are to mysticism, and to highlight the unique ways Maimonides flirts with and plays with classic concepts emerging from the ancient cauldron of Jewish mysticism, like angelification, putting his unique philosophical spin on them, and then inevitably, whether he likes it or not, letting them back into the bloodstream of Judaism to be picked up and played with again by the mystics, the philosophers, or whoever else wishes to partake in the continuing conversation spanning the millennia we call Judaism. Adam Ofterman, in his very fine scholarship, highlights the way that the early Kabbalists, particularly someone like Nachmanides, the Ramban, a Torah scholar of epic historic proportions, a seminal figure amongst the 13th century Spanish Kabbalists, and an avid reader and student of Maimonides, the way that he and his fellow Kabbalists made use of Maimonides' theory of prophecy. Nachmanides adopts these core principles from Maimonides. 
that an individual may, at an advanced stage in their religious journey, unite their mind with a specific gradation of being, a cosmic intellect, among the chain up to God, and in doing so becomes part of, participates in, or integrates into the divine or some intermediary aspect emanating from and emerging from the divine. And that this process signifies or constitutes the ultimate redemptive transformation of the individual. To quote Ofterman, many Kabbalists took Maimonides' noetic unit of formula and used it to explain this process of an ontological transformation leading to complete unity with metaphysical or theosophical ranks identified as angels. In addition to the potential for the transformation of one's being into the metaphysical realm of the separate intellects identified with the angels via the power of the intellect, the Kabbalists also speak in this context of the unitive transformation of the individual into the superhuman or the first ideal human or the Adam Kadman, the primordial human. Maimonides' theory of union with the angelic realm is read by the Kabbalists as an act of mystical union and plays into Nachmanides' systematic understanding of the afterlife in which the human is elevated into a semi-divine existence and also accounts for, as influentially observed by Pico della Marangela, for more extreme forms of apotheosis of a human's transformation into the divine, as in the cases of Enoch's transformation into the angel Metatron and Elijah's heavenly ascent and immortality. Oftman points out some differences, however, between the way that this idea is understood and expressed by Maimonides and how it gets altered by the Kabbalists like Nachmanides. For Nachmanides, this transformative union takes place between the human and God, God's self, integrating the individual into the divine itself, while for Maimonides, in Afterman's opinion, the union only takes place with a certain rung of the angelic realm, in other words, with the active intellect, but not with God, God's self. And secondly, Afterman sees this desire for union and transformation to be a goal which the Kabbalists hold as their ideal and push us to strive towards it, despite the risks involved, the risk of dying as a result of this striving, a risk which the Kabbalists often embrace. Whereas for Maimonides, while this prophetic union and transformation suddenly plays a central role in his religious philosophy, he doesn't, in Afterman's opinion, promote it as the active goal for which the individual religion ought to be striving. As we progress along with the series, we're going to look carefully at this dual assertion made by Afterman and ask indeed if Maimonides believes that the individual can unite with God, and if this is something which Maimonides posits as a goal to be pursued in the religious life of an individual, all of that in due course. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for learning with us together. Thank you to all of the patrons who continue to make this project possible. Thank you to this public library for hosting me for the filming. If you know any institutions in Jerusalem that have some nice bookshelves and quiet rooms that would like to host these episodes, please do let me know. In the next episode, we'll be taking everything that we said here one step further, talking about Maimonides' epistemology, his theory of knowledge and psychology, and how, in his opinion, one might just transform themselves into and unite with the active intellect, and maybe even with God. Thank you for joining us, and as always, keep seeking.